I'm here with Ellen Rose Hendricks Dotter and Anthony Faramelli, and uh, just discussing uh, um, uh, the catalog on brutality, a name of which I think Anthony disagrees in, in large measure um, to the, the focus on these images representing a notion of brutality and perhaps even the genesis of the word brutality in the way that it is sort of changed culturally from being, in your estimation, something that is not of, uh, uh, that can never be qu quite quantified as into human aspects, but well, rather a savage or an ennoble. Well, it, it's not so much that's changed per se, but I guess my question would be where does brutality come from? How is it used um, historically as well? Sure. Because it's, it's always used to represent that which is non-human, that which is subhuman. Right. You know, this is why it's so hard to say a person is inherently brutal, because that's to suggest that they lack humanity, that they're not a person. Um, you know, nature's brutal. Animals are brutal. You know, when you, when you see these nature documentaries of, like, spiders killing their prey and eating them alive, you know, you're like, oh, that's, that's horrible. That's brutal. Hmm. You know, because this is inherently an unhuman act. This is why when you look at... Mass. Because because the act of, of which one life to sustain on another, or, I mean, using the example of, um, you know, an insect behavior, for example, you know, calling it brutal when you watch a lion tear into an antelope. Well, th this is the level of discourse it exists at, right? This is why um, an animal rights activist, for example, will refer to a slaughterhouse as brutal. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a brutal thing to do. Um, so they would be wrong by saying that? No, 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 not at all. Okay. What it is, though, it's the strategic way in which you use the word. Um, but what I'm trying to, to show is the connotation that the word always carries with it is something which is inherently unhuman. Okay. You know, something that exists beyond morality. Um, as long as we can think, we've had this idea of people being elevated above nature, above animals. We can never conceptualize a human being as being flesh, of being animal. Whether it's from deity, you know, that we are elevated by God or whatever, um, that, that we are above the animal kingdom. Whether it's more kind of a humanist idea that we are imbued with sp specific, like, ethical considerations. You know, that, like, people are inherently ethical. But, but in my, my estimation, and it's quite a bit of a sort of dark estimation, misanthropic, because I don't believe that. I mean, I know that I would say that a majority of people do. I personally don't believe that. I think men are... Um, well, but then this is the question, then. Is it's in what, ter in what way do you use the word brutal? Yeah. You know, um, so... Can you use it as in its application to the images? I mean, uh, some of the sort of focus of images here or anything from John F. Kennedy, you know, on the day of, of being shot to Morgan, the, uh, uh, you know, human remain finding best friend. Labrador. So, and, and, and you pointed out rightfully with a Jenny Kramer carte visite of the uh, young woman who was uh, brutally murdered, that it's an incredibly banal image and doesn't mm -hmm. translate for you in any sort of concept, an image of brutality as it, as it wouldn't for most. So with, within contextualization of this, um, does it become brutal when you find out how she was murdered? Or, I mean, does it... Well, no. Because that, that goes with this sort of superfluous notion of humans creating brutality. Well, it, it's not a brutal image because, I mean, the image is just a portrait of a woman. Um, you know, th there is absolutely nothing brutal about that whatsoever. You know, it's it's a lovely young woman, I guess. Yeah, of course. Um, sitting in, in a nice kind of flowery, frilly hat. Um, and, and that's all it is. And there's nothing brutal about knowing the fact that she died in a horrific way. You know, statistically speaking, we all know someone who has or is going to die in a horrific way. Such um, as decapitation. Such as decapitation. <laughs> um, you know, like... Was she wearing the hat? <laughs> Not for long. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's... <laughs> Sorry, terrible okay. um, yeah, no, I would have to disagree though. I mean, with. The, you find this brutal? With the backstory? With the backstory, I do, because the beauty is even more accentuated by the fact that, you know, 
what what was about to happen to her. If if we're going to go with Anthony's feelings about you know the genesis of, of the idea of brutality and not being in effect that I would ask Anthony if you could swing to our side of things and see how we're promoting this notion of what maybe well, culturally you're or not, you're pop not pro- culture. You're, you're not be. promoting brutality. You're not promoting images of brutality. What you're trying to represent is a fantasy of brutality. You know, this exists purely within the imagination now. We are allowing ourselves to take a little mental vacation and fantasize of a horrific act. So the brutality then is entirely internalized and entirely projected upon the image, which is why for me, I cannot see this as a brutal image because I don't have this fantasy at work. Right, right. Um, so, it's, so how do you turn yourself? It's not so much a fantasy as knowledge, is it? And it There's points a fascination the, yeah, with the brutality of, of existence and of beauty and and the time span, which it you never know when it's gonna end. So. Are we nostalgizing this though? I mean, is this something that you and I have a, a, a problem with because we like? <laughs> Images like this because it uh, takes us back to a, not necessarily maybe for me a fantasy about the tragedy, but it also is encapsulated in the time frame of which it was manufactured. I I can think of what it must have been like to be in Victorian London, let alone Connecticut, and I have that. It's not a nostalgia because I don't quite understand it as such. Like I could have a nostalgia from the eighties easily because I, I I grew up in it, so it is a projection of fantasy, I guess, in that mm-hmm. respect. No, I mean, and it is nostalgia. It's absolutely a nostalgic thing that, that you're looking back and trying to, you, you said it, the beauty. Mm-hmm. You know, it's only beauty because you know it ended tragically. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so it's an absolute story. And, and there, therein lies the fantasy, is you're narrativizing something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we obviously have no information about this woman. And fantasy isn't to suggest that it's something that you or I want to put onto it in any sort of... Um, I mean, when you talk about nostalgizing, when we say fantasy, for me it becomes um, somehow a, a nefarious term, like as in to fantasize about something is to want, to desire to understand it either through images or, you know, just a shared understanding. So for me, that would suggest that I have a fantasy towards wanting to be somehow involved or around the tragedy if I'm mentally nostalgizing or historicizing it in my mind. Well, I mean, there's nothing, like, nefarious about fantasy. I mean, all humans fantasize. Um, so it's neither like, good nor bad. It's, it's no, no, it's, it's what it is. <clears throat> right. You know, and, and you can't divorce yourself from fantasy. Um, you know, that's an inherent aspect of the unconscious mind always projects and always starts narrativizing. So, so that's not necessarily a problem. So do you find other. you fight those notions? Because for me, it seems secondhand to do this. And you were saying sort of you don't see it that way. So are you able to distance yourself and detach perhaps differently than myself or Ellen Rose? Well, I, I mean... Because we, we immediately have this stored thing. You know, we have this, this, this beauty, this tragedy, this historicization of the image. So for us, it does lead. I wouldn't say you're wrong mm-hmm. towards a sort of fantasy mm-hmm. or nostalgia. Are you, and you don't feel that, but or do you feel that as well? Here's a good one. This image um, from the Mau Mau mm-hmm. um, uprising in Kenya, you know, like this is something that functions on a far different level. You know, um, this image as contrary to the other ones, you could say this is a brutal image. You know, this is a decapitated woman's body. Um, you know, the, the joints are split out. The body has been reduced to a piece of meat. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's dehumanized. It's a dehumanized chunk of flesh. As such, it is moving beyond what we imagine as people, right? You know, it's, what it's about animal. the moments before dehumanization? Anyways. Well, it's, yeah, equally brutal, only because you know the following. The following, you know. Um, and again, that's a projection, but, you know, it's relatively, relatively spot on. Um, so, so these function for me in a very different way. Okay. Um, 
you there's know. almost a political discourse that's uh, at work on the, I mean Kennedy as well but there's almost a political discourse on the two images that we're, we're sort of talking to. I know I led you into the Saunders Chinese execution mm -hmm. from the Mao Mao, but I mean, there's something post-colonial, I would imagine, on, on, on your end here, obviously, with the... Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the Mao Mao's were fighting for the independence of Kenya. You know, they're, they're fighting against the colonial invaders. Um, so there is a different narrativization going on there.